Hey everyone, so I want to try something different on the channel today and see how it goes. It's an idea I've had for a while where I take a pro wrestling gimmick or character and look at it with a bit more detail and really explore what made the characters work, their motivations, their weaknesses and their strengths. I want to try to keep it all within the scripted world of pro wrestling and keep it all pretty kayfabe. For sure I'll talk about the ideas and concepts behind the gimmicks and how they came to be, but I'd like to keep these videos kinda semi fictional if that makes sense. It won't always work because some gimmicks are just centered around the wrestler's real life personality turned up to 11, but I think there's also things we could potentially miss or even ignore when it comes to the goal of certain characters in pro wrestling. One of wrestling's more interesting characters and one I've always been intrigued by is the Raven character portrayed by Scott Levy and Raven's going to be the subject of the first video in this series. I want to break these videos down into chapters. The first chapter will be all about the creation of the gimmick if there's enough verified information available. The second chapter will be about the characteristics of the gimmick. The third chapter will be about matches, promos, feuds and moments that highlighted those characteristics of the gimmick, kinda providing viewers with examples to check out if they want to see the character they're at their best. In the final chapter we'll hopefully wrap things up by discussing how the gimmick did or didn't evolve, others who took inspiration from the gimmick and the overall impact it had on the future of pro wrestling. So we're going to start with Raven. Let me know what you think about this idea in the comments because if it's something you wouldn't want to see then I'd rather know than create more of these you know. If you like the idea, great, give me your feedback and suggestions for future characters to look at. Finally, and this is important, these videos are not supposed to be career retrospectives. You guys may think that I've left too much stuff out because you might be more used to the career focused video that I put up on the channel that looks at stuff from A to B. That's not what these videos are about so please keep that in mind if you think I should have talked about certain career highlights. These videos are supposed to explore the gimmicks themselves and not the wrestlers careers from start to end. Scott Levy had quite a few characters and gimmicks before finding success with Raven, with two gimmicks in particular standing out, Scotty Flamingo in WCW and Johnny Polo in WWF. Scott didn't like neither gimmick. Scotty Flamingo was a surfer dude from Florida and Johnny Polo was a spoiled kid who predominantly managed WWF superstars such as Adam Bomb and the Quebecers, though he did get in the ring on quite a few occasions too. Scott continued to portray these gimmicks because he felt he had no choice. Landing a job in WWF or WCW was quite a big deal so you're gonna do pretty much what you're told, especially if you haven't been a main eventer on TV elsewhere. Personally speaking, I didn't mind Scotty Flamingo all that much and I thought he suited the Diamond Mine stable of which he was part of during the later days of his WCW run. Johnny Polo, on the other hand, didn't have that many redeeming qualities, but one thing was for sure, Scott could talk, I mean he could talk a lot and his delivery was always solid. So solid that he was placed on commentary a few times and he also hosted a few shows and videotapes for WWF. Scott left the WWF to join ECW in 1995 and it was in ECW where the Raven character would debut on television. The man responsible for coming up with Raven? Well, it was old Scott really, but the man who showed him the direction he needed to go in was Diamond Dallas Page. In an interview with ESPN, Scott said, I didn't necessarily want to be a badass because there's so many badasses in the business, but Paige talked me into it. He said, if you want to be a chicken shit heel, you're not going to get booked. Nobody's buying that character anymore. You gotta be something different. You gotta be tougher. And I'm like, alright, I'll be the character that I actually am inside, the tortured soul. Scott's mentioned many inspirations and ideas he had for the Raven character. He mentioned in the same interview that Raven was like Robert Plant if Robert Plant had baggage, while also mentioning that he wanted to pattern Raven after Jim Morrison. The name of course is from the famous Raven poem by Edgar Allan Poe, as is Raven's promo sign off. Quote to Raven, nevermore. In another inspiration was Patrick Swayze's character Bodhi, the main antagonist from the 1991 movie Point Break. 
Not only was Bodhi a skilled athlete, he was a criminal. The most powerful tool at his disposal was his mind, how he could remain calm in the face of death, and he also saw himself as a liberator, a man who wanted freedom in a culture enslaved by routine. Bodhi was the bad guy that you liked, and there's probably millions of people all around the world who could identify with his philosophy, motivations, and intentions. But when he takes things too far, that's when you realize he maybe isn't the great crusader that you once thought he was. The same could be said for Raven. With all the previous inspirations in mind, maybe the greatest driving force behind the Raven character was 90s society and the grunge subculture among teenagers and young adults. A subculture begins and evolves when a number of people who don't want to conform to social norms connect with other folks who share the same views. The grunge subculture, however, went global with many of its themes and ideology still very prevalent in society today. It began in Seattle and it took over the world with bands like The Melvin, Sound Garden, Alice in Chains, and of course Nirvana providing the soundtrack to this new cultural movement. And you'd only have to look up some song lyrics to narrow down the general themes of the grunge movement, the things that made it resonate so much with 90s youth. Themes explored within grunge music include social isolation, self-doubt, neglect, abuse, trauma, a desire to belong, loneliness and despair. When it came to dealing with love, you'd find most songs would deal with doomed, failed or damaged relationships. The state of society and social prejudices could be heard in many, many songs, and it's all wrapped up with loud guitars and raspy vocalists who could sing or scream their lyrics. Raven looked like a grunger, and through his promos we would learn that he too shared a similar outlook to those within grunge subculture. As mentioned, he was a tortured soul. He told us that he was neglected as a child, self-doubt about his own worth was distilled in him through his days of getting bullied in school, he went through emotional trauma, he was a damaged individual who felt left out. What about Raven? What about me? It all started from a very young age with Raven. He went through so much trouble at school and at home that it deeply affected his mental state growing up, and it's through this troubled youth that forms the basis for the gimmick itself. He dressed accordingly for the character too, wearing concert and band shirts, a leather jacket and tatty ripped jeans. He changed his hairstyle to be a bit more messy and rough, he got some piercings, and he'd even sometimes wear light makeup, something he phased out but brought back later on. Grunge subculture, nonconformity, a troubled past and the promise of a bleak future was what made up the Raven character. With a character like this that's deeply rooted in one's personality, Raven simply had to be a good promo in order to get his message across. Raven isn't a gimmick that speaks for itself simply through bell to bell action, so the more promo time Raven could get, the better. Paul Heyman knew how big the character could be, and with Paul being more tuned into what was going on in modern times, he knew that Raven would connect to more people through what he said rather than what he did in the ring. It was also a stroke of genius to make Raven a bad guy. So think about this, Raven's message and Raven's personality was going to connect well with others who had the same ideology. To these fans, Raven was right and Raven had every reason to be angry at the world. But for those who weren't part of the grunge subculture, they might see Raven as someone who just pissed and moaned a lot, a bratty, weak little crybaby who can't deal with life's difficulties when everyone else has to suck it up and get on with it. For fans who understood Raven and maybe felt the same way, he had every right to be the bad guy. He had every right to moan and complain because he's a product of a failed society. It's not Raven's fault he's the way he is, and if he wants to take it out on others, then good, let him. In essence, it creates a very multi-layered character that's all about psychology, and it was Raven's psychology and mental state that made him so dangerous. Raven's words could brainwash others. He could make others see how the establishment had turned him into men or women they didn't want to be. He could even brainwash children into turning against their parents. And he had the ability to make his minions look up to him as a leader, the one who made them see the light, so to speak. 
He was able to bring factions of followers into both ECW and WCW, Raven's Nest and Raven's Flock. Those beneath him would do his bidding by launching attacks and competing in matches that Raven didn't want to work in, and Raven would treat his underlings like dirt because, as he would put it, Raven was the only one who ever gave them a chance. Raven was the only one who understood them, and if many of these guys and girls who joined his group didn't have Raven, then they'd be hopeless outcasts who nobody wanted. This was a little more prevalent in WCW, Raven's flock would sometimes feel like a bunch of brainwashed zombies who would do whatever Raven wanted without question, but eventually, when an opportunity presented itself to leave the group, most members of Raven's flock got fed up and they left Raven behind. Let's look at some moments and matches featuring Raven that I think do a great job of showing us what the character was all about. First, his ECW debut is must see. It was quickly established that Raven was a loner who was dealing with past trauma, and his first major storyline looked to rectify some of that past trauma. Raven had history with Tommy Dreamer. Stevie Richards, the man who introduced Raven to ECW fans, said Raven had some issues with Tommy even before Raven showed up to TV, and Tommy became Raven's target from the day Scott entered the land of extreme in ECW. A few months after his debut, we would learn about a girl who attended the same camp as Raven and Dreamer. She was rejected by Tommy due to having acne and being overweight. Raven would end up getting with the girl and years later he found her again. She was now a penthouse model and she also had a vendetta against Tommy for rejecting her all those years ago. Her name was Beulah McGillicuddy and Raven was using Tommy's past to hurt him in the present. The feud with Tommy Dreamer, seen by many ECW fans, is the premier rivalry of the entire company, one that was deeply personal and one that allowed Scott to really show off what the Raven character was all about. Raven's nest was cultivated during the Dreamer feud and fans understood who Raven was when the rivalry cooled off. It never ended though, and it never really ended due to the two working together again long after ECW. But the 1995 portion of the angle was a great way for Raven to get his message across to viewers at home. There was also the time when Raven made the Sandman's own wife and son turn against them. Raven used his powers of persuasion to brainwash Sandman's family, and there's probably no better way to make things personal and get the upper hand against the enemy. Tyler and Lori became members of Raven's Nest and they would follow Raven's commands. The ultimate goal was to mentally destroy the Sandman, and this rivalry would give us one of ECW's most controversial moments, the crucifixion of the Sandman. Raven spoke about this moment in a 2014 shoot interview and he said, I knew I needed to come back with some sort of impact and I thought, man, why don't I crucify the Sandman? That'd be great. I've always said that Raven is a martyr for society's dysfunction, and so now I'll make Sandman feel how I feel. I'll make him a martyr for society's dysfunction now and let him feel my pain. Upon his debut in WCW, we would learn that Raven still had the ability to somehow control people. Stevie Richards, a member of the original Raven's Nest, came over to WCW with Raven and immediately Raven began treating him poorly. Stevie was an associate of Raven's, he accompanied Raven to the arenas and he sat beside him in the crowd, but Raven would abuse his friend and treat him like dirt only for Stevie to be right by his side again the following week. Raven's debut match in WCW was a clash of the champions 35 against Richards. Raven won the match and the story didn't get a chance to wrap up due to Stevie leaving the company, but I'll assume that he would have remained part of Raven's flock as the faction grew. In WCW, Raven was given a lot of pre-taped vignettes, which was surprising seeing as the company was so laser focused on the NWO. These vignettes repeated a lot of what was already said in ECW, but they were spared some better production values as Raven talked about his abusive father, the kids who bullied him at school, and how he was going to repay society at large for banishing him and leaving him out in the cold. If you're not a fan of ECW's presentation, then the WCW vignettes are a good alternative, though the overall grittiness of the ECW promos suit Raven way better, in my opinion. Raven's feud with Perry Saturn in WCW is also worth looking back on. This was, in my opinion, the best example of someone turning their back on Raven due to Raven's insistence on treating people poorly. 
Saturn and Raven were friends growing up and Raven would say he was always there for Perry during Saturn's darkest times. When things went bad between the two though, Saturn would say that Raven was actually spoiled rotten as a kid. He had everything he ever wanted and all this talk about Raven having a rough childhood was make believe. Saturn kinda struggled to leave Raven's side but he finally had enough and he wanted to leave the flock. Raven, however, wasn't about to let Saturn just walk out without putting up a fight. Raven agreed to grant Saturn and the whole flock their freedom if Saturn could beat him on pay per view. If Raven won, however, Saturn would be Raven's servant forever. In the end, Saturn was able to defeat his former best friend and the group would disband, bringing on a pretty significant character evolution for Raven that maybe did him more harm than good. In WCW, anyway. It would turn out that Saturn was telling the truth, Raven did come from a well off household and he was a spoiled kid growing up. After the flock disbanded, Raven's world came tumbling down and he ended up refusing to wrestle matches. He took some time off and when he came back, his character backstory was explored more, highlighting some contradictions. His home life was explored in some vignettes that aired on WCW television and in a way, this kind of changed everything we knew about Raven. He wasn't mentally abused, he wasn't treated poorly as a kid, he had everything he wanted. Raven, however, had visited some mental institutions and when his mother asks him to go back, Raven refuses to do so. These vignettes also brought Chastity back, a former member of Raven's Nest, and they also introduced the Sandman to WCW audiences. Many fans enjoyed these vignettes for the humour involved, while a few hardcore Raven fans didn't like them at all. What a mark! Even today, it seems like a sore point judging by comments made online. Raven was much more like a spoiled rich emo kid in comparison to the gritty, deep thinking anti-social grunger that brought him to superstardom. The feedback is mixed on the character evolution, though I'll repeat that many fans found the vignettes very entertaining. In the WWF, Raven didn't get a chance at all to build or evolve the character. Paul Heyman understood the importance of Raven getting mic time whereas it felt like the WWF just saw him as another former ECW guy who should get thrown in with the other ECW guys. So those traits of Raven being a loner and non-conforming were thrown completely out the window. I could talk on about this but I want these videos to remain character focused so we won't get into the nitty gritty of it all. But in comparison to ECW and WCW, Raven's WWF runs simply didn't provide him with any opportunities to grow grow or evolve as a gimmick, which really was and still is a shame. In TNA, Raven kinda reverted back to what brought him to the dance and for a while it was extremely successful. Raven became the NWA champion at Slammiversary 2005, but down the line TNA tried to introduce their own version of Raven's nest named Serotonin. Raven would punish members of the group for losing matches, it had that same kind of thing going on where Raven looked down on members of his own faction, but there were no long term plans for Serotonin and it just kinda fizzled out. TNA fans rank Serotonin as one of the weaker groups to ever appear in the company. Through TNA though and even on the Ring of Honor and the Independents, Raven remained as an alternative wrestling character, making alterations to his attire and moving on from the grunge look as the years went on. Raven's character stood out a lot in the 90s due to how well Scott nailed down the look and motivations behind the character. It was the right time and the right place for Raven to shine during the mid 90s and it's a character that can never be replicated due to the changing of time itself. The gimmick embodied a shift in culture, it encapsulates a time period and therefore I don't think we'll ever see another Raven again because it just wouldn't work as well as what it did in the 90s. Sure, other superstars can come along and psychological warfare can be their main offensive weapon, but to do it the way Raven did with all the self-loathing, self-pity and his overall need for acceptance while decked out in band t-shirts, a leather jacket and a flannel wrapped around his waist, it just wouldn't hit the same at all. It's one of those things that could only rise within ECW. There was absolutely no way Raven could have debuted in WWF during early 1995 and the same is very true for WCW in 95 also. So, so even if you weren't a fan of ECW at the time, there's absolutely no denying that the company's existence would give us great, more contemporary characters that did a much better job of targeting the young male demographic. 
Raven was so multi-layered too that fans looked at him in many different ways. You could hate the guy, you could feel sorry for the guy, you could see him as this tortured soul or you could see him as plain irresponsible and that's why it was so good. His motivations weren't always clear, he did things to get revenge for a past we only heard about from Raven himself, yet he could verbally paint a picture to get viewers to understand where he was coming from. And his overall look, his attire and how he carried himself to and from the ring perfectly fit into this character he was trying to get across. You actually believe that Scott Levy was the Raven character and in my opinion that's where the money is. I hope you guys enjoyed this look at the Raven character and again I'd like to hear your feedback in regards to future videos taking on this kind of theme and format. Like reliving the war when it first started I used a lot of your suggestions and ideas to make the show better and I'd like to do the same for this if I do decide to make it a full blown series on the channel. Other characters I've thought about covering for this include the Vigilante Sting, Doink, Kane and Mankind. And other more trickier ones I've thought about tackling that could make good videos include Triple H, Razor Ramon, The Miz and Chris Jericho. Not every wrestler would be eligible for this kind of video because there's only so much you can say about some guys characters and as mentioned some wrestlers don't have elaborate characters or gimmicks so do keep that in mind when offering your suggestions. Thanks very much for watching though guys and I do hope you enjoyed this one. Take care.